Well, welcome back to World War II TV. I am Paul Woodadge, and if you watched last night's show with Peter Hart, well, that was amazing. I promise you someone who swears a bit less today. Peter Hart, the elder statesman of oral history, got a bit carried away last night. It was brilliant. But anyway, today we are doing our last kind of Normandy show. We've got one more later today. It's a double bill for you today about Normandy. Then I'm going to be busy with all the commemorations and remembrance events and all the people coming over, then coming back to you again to talk about Normandy. Uh, point to Steve Zaloga's back on after the anniversary. But today I'm delighted to bring in someone who is bringing World War II and D-Day and commemorations and understanding veterans to kind of a younger audience because she's a filmmaker. Uh, Charlotte Jurgens is from New York and she has, well, been on a nine-year pilgrimage project to get this film out. And the film we're talking about, she was just 20 when she accompanied a group of D-Day veterans to Normandy in 2014 for the 70th anniversary. And I wonder to myself whether or not our paths crossed some point during that week then, but they may have done. And now her film is available online for streaming and DVD. And of course, all the links you need, as usual, folks, are in the description below. And of course, I always say my usual stuff. Don't forget to click uh, to, to like what we're doing, to uh, share what we're doing with your friends. Consider becoming a patron or a YouTube member and support the work of my guests. Without further ado, I'm going to bring Charlotte in. So it's morning where you are, Charlotte. Good morning. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Well, thank you very much for coming along because, you know, I just was talking to you before going live. We are in an era now where we're about to move transition from Normandy being somewhere where there are participants in the invasion being here to not being here. Every year that comes by, so this will be the last one there are veterans here, but sooner or later there really will be a last one where the veterans are here. I'm off to Deauville with Mag, my other half, on Thursday. Uh, 30 American veterans are arriving with the Best Defense Foundation, um, but how many more years of this are we going to be uh, experiencing? So Anyway, you started this project. I kind of gave a bit away in the in the in the intro there, but you, you know, you this is a long project for you, and you were very young. I mean, I'm not being saying that in a patronizing way, but most of my <laughs> middle aged red trouser wearing white middle class blokes, and you have an interest in this from a different demographic. So basically, Charlotte, how did it all start? Um, thank you for asking. Yeah, it. I was very young when this started. Um, I was. 19 when I started planning the project and had just turned 20 a few days before we started filming. So this project was inspired by my great grandfather, Pat Hanna, who landed on D-Day and um, who died before I was born. I never had a chance to meet him. But my mother in the 90s recorded an audio interview with him when he was on his deathbed and he'd never wanted to talk about World War II before but he realized it was his last chance and opened up to her. And so I grew up with this recording of my great grandfather's voice. And I thought his stories were incredible and was just kind of transfixed by it. So when the 70th anniversary of D-Day was coming up in 2014, I got this idea to retrace Pat's route through Normandy. And um, I was doing research for that and found out about a group of American veterans from the 29th division who were planning to do the same thing, to retrace that same route. And since Pat had served with the 29th for part of his time during uh, World War II, it seemed like kind of a perfect opportunity. And it turned out that uh, that group of American veterans really needed somebody to be kind of a, um, like a chaperone health aid person for two, guys who were in their 90s who had Parkinson's. And they just needed somebody to, you know, uh, open the car doors for them and help them zip up their jackets and tie their shoes every morning. And I had been kind of chatting with them around that time. So they gave me kind of the offer of a lifetime that if I were willing to travel with Don and his cousin Bill, these two veterans from um, the 29th Division Association, then I could kind of just live with the group for the summer and film. And man, that really changed my life. And I really didn't know what I was getting into at the beginning. I was, you know, basically a teenager and it seemed really exciting. And I was like, okay. And then, um, yeah, those became some of the most important friendships um, I've ever experienced. And, um, you know, it's... Uh, the film is a little bit less about World War II history 
and a little bit more about those friendships and about the relationship. So um, because it's more of a film about memory and about um, connection and age than about you know the like the facts of D-Day, although there's a lot of that in there too. Um, I think it can connect, and I, I've been really kind of thrilled to see how well it connects with younger people, and particularly with younger women who might not have felt um, that military history was for them before. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, it, it's an interesting, it's a, a little bit of a different take because you're getting to know these 90 year old men's stories through the eyes of a of a 20 year old woman. So. Um, I think, you know, for, for people who are even younger than me, who might not ever have a chance to meet a World War II veteran um, themselves, it provides kind of a, like a point of access, I guess, um, where you can just get a sense of what it means to have a friendship with one of these guys, what it, what it means to have casual kind of conversation, um, co really conversation style interactions with them rather than formal interviews. So, um, yeah, I think to me, the most meaningful thing has been seeing, uh, you know, high school students and current college students watch the film who will never really have a chance to meet one of these guys in person and have them go, you know, wow, I really care about this now. And my favorite thing is when people in that demographic say, you know, my grandfather fought in World War II and he's still around and I've never um, had a conversation with him about it. I've never been interested and now I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and have have that conversation at least show that i'm interested and that i care and that makes me really happy so yeah that's the brilliant thing. i mean and i've just we've got some images you sent promotional images from the film and it's called sunken roads which i love because basically the first thing i ever did on world war ii tv was a 20 minute documentary explaining what hedgerows are and i talked about the sunken lane so you're 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 right up my street there and that you're talking about these sunken roads that are there between Omaha Beach and Omaha uh, and San Lo, and you walk them, and you, you, having seen what they are, you can understand what these guys, when they're returning there, they're seeing somewhere that's both beautiful and somehow hypnotic in in peacetime, but deadly and scary in World War Two. And I like exactly where you're coming from with this idea of being a younger person, because the limited amount of work I do with veterans, and Magma the Half does more now is the things that they get excited about are talking to school groups and talking to the young people. They will sit and listen to the, the, the events and the ceremonies where the mayors speak and the senators speak and the generals speak, and they'll be respectful and they're, they're, they're appreciated. They, they like being appreciated, mm -hmm. but their eyes light up when they're passing it on to, a, to, a, to someone younger. And I think that's where someone like yourself, you almost have a shortcut that I don't have because I, I kind of come at it from a, which section of the beach were you on and were you attached to B Company and that kind of thing. And they, they're happy to answer those questions, but what they prefer is kind of making a connection with someone several generations removed to just kind of talk about stuff. And that's clearly what you did there. So tell us about the, well, we've got, we'll go through some of the images and then tell us about some of the people that were on the trip. Cause one of the people on there, Hal Baumgarten was a really close and dear friend of mine for many years, yes. but, and, 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 I can't imagine what it'd be like to be, I'm assuming that was your first trip to France. Um, I had been to France before, um, okay. but I've never been Normandy. to Normandy. Yeah, and first trip were there with filmmaking, I'm assuming, and first trip there with people who'd fought through there. And I know about the pressures and things of filmmaking and, and how you've got to get it there and have you got the right equipment and what's the sound like and is, the, is it going to rain and have, that per, have I got that person mic'd up correctly? And 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 what am I going to get here and and battery power and all that kind of stuff there so um, so much to think about and yet you're also connecting with these people on a personal level so did you come at it before we go through some of the people did you come at it from a this is what I plan to do or did you kind of go into it completely well I'll just see what happens and let 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 the course kind of go its way yeah that's such a great question I mean I think for me um I was lucky enough to grow up with two uh, film editors as parents. So I, I grew up watching a lot of experimental documentaries and um, and uh, interesting first person forms of storytelling through film. And I really love films, and I always have, that start in one place and that end in a completely different place. And um, where, you know, you just kind of go with the flow and allow the story to find itself as you're filming. So that was 
what I wanted to do. I wanted to kind of just be there with my camera if these guys wanted to talk um, and then kind of let them take it from there, you know? And um, there are all kinds of things in the film that I never could have expected <laughs> going in, but that's what makes it, uh, that, that's what makes it so special to me. Um, so yeah, I uh, shot this film as a one woman crew. I really wanted to um, have a very kind of intimate approach to filmmaking. I had a pretty small camera. It was important to me to have a camera that I could hold in my lap rather than have, you know, over my shoulder in kind of an intimidating way. Um, so I really wanted these to not feel like interviews, to just, you know, spend hours chatting and see where the conversations went. Um, so yeah, there was no, uh, nobody else, no big microphone, no big lighting setup. And that definitely means that there are moments where, um, you know, technically, uh, things might not be quite as, you know, stable and polished as, um, as some documentaries, but I think that there is a little bit of a raw quality to the film. Like you just kind of feel like you're right in the car there with them, which is, um, I don't know. It was a really meaningful way to film it because it also meant that I had a little bit more bandwidth to just be in the moment. Mm. Um, so yeah, to talk about the people in this film, you're right now looking at a picture of myself and Don McCarthy, who I miss every day. Um, I was just speaking with his son, Jim, yesterday, and it is really hard to not have Don with us anymore. He's an incredibly charismatic storyteller. Um, and just emotionally open person. Um, it really was incredible as a 20 year old to have him not go, oh, you know, you're some kid, you probably don't care about this, you're probably not interested in this, I won't tell, uh, I won't tell you the details. Instead, he was, he told me, you know, I was exactly your age when I landed on D-Day. Mm -hmm. You're gonna get this. Like, you, you, you know what I mean? He was like, you're 20 now as we're going through Normandy. I was 20 then when we were going through Normandy. And it, um, we bonded really fast and I felt every single moment so lucky to, um, to, you know, be spending so much time with him. So Don was the veteran with Parkinson's who I was assigned to, uh, uh, you know, kind of be his traveling companion. And it was Don and his cousin, Bill, who also had Parkinson's. So, you know, they're, they're very, uh, some of these guys are very tenacious and mischievous. So <laughs> with Don, um, I didn't get on that trauma, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So with Don, um, he had, he wanted to go through the areas where they trained, not just the areas where they fought. So he wanted to go through Cornwall. He wanted to spend a lot of time in England. He wanted to cross over to France by ferry so that it was by boat and exactly the same way as they did it then. And the rest of the group was only going to kind of go to Paris and then meet up in Normandy. And he said, that's not enough for me. I want to do everything. And his family said, you know, OK, but you have Parkinson's. You've got to have somebody to travel with you. And he said, yeah, I've got somebody. I've got somebody. It's fine. Then less than a month before they were going to go over there, his family was like, so who do you have going with you? And he said, oh, my cousin Bill. Now, Bill's even older than Don and has even worse Parkinson's. And they were sure that they could figure it out, you know, like D-Day didn't stop them. Why should this? And his family was pretty desperate to figure out just somebody to, you know, just to help out with logistics. So I feel so lucky that I was kind of in the right place at the right time to be paired up with Don. So that's Don. Then there's Hal Baumgarten, who you know well. Oh, this is Arden Earl, who... Um, is just such a genuinely humble, genuinely modest person. Um, I, I met him a couple of times. He's one of those ones that spoke a little, spoke few words, but when they did come, they were really powerful and poignant. Um, yeah. Hal kind of, I mean, we haven't got a photo of Hal, but Hal was quite polished by this point, I suppose, because he'd done a lot of public speaking, and you know, so he 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 was he was kind of the slick professional in some ways, and right. yet also at some points would kind of get get a bit where a question would come out and he hadn't expected he'd kind of he'd, he'd break a bit but it, they all had their characters and, and and you know you found that out and i think 
probably uh, the advantage you had is you didn't set out to tell the combat chronicle of the 29th division so i must get in that battle there and i must make sure i cover the support you're just there to document what happens and, mm-hmm. and, and leave because you had joe balkowski involved in it leave someone like joe to document with his amazing books what the 29th division did if you want to see which company was where on what day beyond right. the beach which in fact i was i've, I've got right i was reading it again <laughs> yesterday yes. <laughs> Three copies of that book, would you believe? Anyway, um, he will provide that. You're just giving this this color, this flavor, this this depth of what it's like coming back there. So, you know, again, you, you went into this without trying to tell the history. You're, you're 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 kind of a carer, assistant, travel organizer to a couple of the guys, and you, you're filming as well. So, did it start off easily, or was it was it kind of? Did, I mean, you said you bonded with Don very quickly. Did did the dynamic of what you were trying to achieve kind of come to you quite quickly, or was it kind of a process over a couple of days to find your feet? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So Don and I kind of bonded instantly, and it was easy with him from the from the beginning. And we spent a lot of time together before we met up with the bigger group in Normandy. And once we got there, Arden was the first uh, vet from that larger group that I tried to interview. And it was, you know, really awkward at first. And we try to show that in the film because I think for a lot of young people, when they start to have these conversations, it might be awkward. It might be a little bit, you you know, you might be uncomfortable. And, and I think that that's, you know, that's just realistic. But with Arden, I tried talking with him and then I made a mistake with my little tripod and nearly broke my camera. Um, and I remember him looking at me like, what's this girl doing here? Right. And, but, you know, I was there long enough. We ended up becoming really, really close. And um, that's one of my favorite parts of the film is just that kind of slow uh, development of my friendship with Arden. Um, And yeah, he is just such a wonderful person. His whole family is so great. So it was wonderful to have him in the film. I I, I find even just, what term do you use? Do you go in with sir? Do you go in with a first name? Do you go in with mister? Do you introduce yourself by your surname? Do you, do you, you don't go for hugs first, but some want hugs. Do you go for handshake first? Right. You know, I still, I still overthink it after having met veterans for 40 years of my life. I still think, go into it thinking, how, how shall I do? Shall I do? Shall I say I'm a historian first? Shall I just say I'm English first? Which, which bit shall I lead with? I still, I still haven't found the perfect recipe. Um, right, for, right. For, in your case, we'll move on. You're dealing with someone French as well. So there's language and, and other experiences. So tell us about Suzette, who I think I've seen at events here in Normandy. Yeah, Suzette is an extraordinary woman. She is. Um, she and Don had been friends since for, for 30 years at the time when we were shooting. And their friendship was kind of incredible because she didn't speak English at all. And he didn't speak French at all. And yet they're both such expressive people with their faces and their, you know, movements that by having other people translate for them, they had managed to become some of the most important people in each other's life, um, despite not not knowing each other's uh, language at all. And, um, you know, when Don first told me about why he wanted to go back for the 70th anniversary, the first person he mentioned was Suzette. Um, And part of the bond that they have is that Suzette promised that she would put flowers every year on the graves of Don's friends um, in Normandy. And she has kept to that through the decades. And so, you know, um, I think one thing I wanted to capture in this film is just the extraordinary care that some of the French folks in Normandy have for these, you know, sacred American spaces. And, um, yeah, Suzette also is just a character. She's hilarious and vivacious. And um, I'm really, you know, her role in the film was, again, one of those things that I couldn't really have expected how it would turn out going in. But it's one of my favorite parts of the film. And I guess if you had been older, you mm-hmm. might have tried to be a bit more controlling of it. Like when I was mm-hmm. you know, 50 yeah. years old, I would probably go in there with more of a plan. But then it would become maybe what I wanted rather than, in your case, what they wanted it to be themselves. And they just told you what they wanted to do and how, I guess they're telling you how they, and it, and it came probably ended up being a better, better result because of it, because you just let it, let it flow. 
Well, you know, one thing that I felt really grateful about at the time of filming and then all through the process of making it afterwards was that Joe Balkowski's books are there because, you know, for especially for the young people who see Sunken Roads and say for the first time, oh, my God, I care about this history now. I want to learn more. I always send them to Joe's books first thing. And, you know, it's there's a real luxury in making a film about something where somebody as extraordinary as Joe has already done so much of the of the research behind, you know, all the details, all the facts, all like all that broader history, because it means that there isn't as much pressure to kind of, you know, capture every single bit of that. Um, so I, uh, I'm really hoping that the film and Joe's books can kind of be good companion pieces for each other. Well, this is where you're, you're right up my street, because I, I believe in a broad front approach, uh, Eisenhower pun there to getting history <laughs> yeah. and history comes from books and podcasts and video games and short films and longer films and documentaries and war movies and you know you, there are people who if you handed them joe's wonderful books first if they were 20 21 years old they might not find that connection with it but via your film it's the perfect way to kind of slide them in by bringing the generation together this isn't, this isn't just history for people who live through the war or whose dads or fathers or mothers in the war it's a history for people who have uh, in your case when you said your great great grandfather because it my might be my, yeah. it's my my uncles and my and my grandfather it's another generation away and there are kids now coming there were tw uh, i'm meeting up with a, a, an english guy and, a, and his teenage son who's 15 or something so He's even another generation from you nearly moved away from World War II. And we are morphing into that era where it'll be great, great, great grandparents, yeah. and which which seems crazy. But another great photo I've done there. So, you know, you're going, you're coming here. I know how those events work. There's, you know, you're moving from a ceremony to a banquet to an experience, things like that. And they always run behind. There's always things <laughs> happening that aren't supposed to be happening. There's always the bus is late. It rains when you're expecting it. Then there's champagne receptions and people start getting a little bit you know, yeah. through the afternoon. So how did you tell them? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? I mean, well, how did you kind of deal with the fact that the, the, as a filmmaker, you kind of want to have kind of a shoot. I know we've discussed it. You want to kind of have a shooting script, but these, these events, it's just kind of go with it yeah. and you've got to kind of be there with the moment and go in there with your camera and, 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 if you're expecting an intimate response to veteran, you're going to get something funny. And if you're expecting something right. huge, you're getting something, you know, revealing. Yeah. You, I guess you were just there and, it, and, and, and took a lot of footage, I guess. Yeah. I mean, to me, the, the thing that really makes the film work is just that we shot for so long. Um, because a lot of the times they would start to tell a story and then they couldn't finish it because like you're saying some scheduling event happens or we have to all rush off to do something or um or they just get really emotional and they're just not ready to continue and because i was shooting i guess it was like 40 days that we were shooting um we would circle back to those stories again and again and sometimes uh it would take six times before they tell a complete version of a story. And that was totally fine with me. So um, I think just kind of sticking around and making it clear that there's no pressure to finish something now or like to get to the sound bite. you know what I mean? Like um, we could just uh, really be a little bit relaxed about that, which was great. I also, there's a scene in the film where we talk about kind of how overwhelming the number of ceremonies are and and how they almost start to blur together um and you know i was very careful every night logging all the footage every place that we were every you know so that i could reference back to it because i knew i would start to forget those details um but i it was important to me to, to capture in the film the rhythm of those ceremonies you know, the standing and the sitting and the songs, the roll out the barrel <laughs> that comes again and again, like hearing taps again and again and all those different versions of it. Because I think, um, you know, th that's kind of at the heart of my own memories of this trip. And I think for Don too, his memories of previous trips, there's this, um, th this very sensory, very colorful, Kind of composite feeling that you get from all those ceremonies that i wanted to capture 
and that's it. The tonal shift is amazing in Normandy. You, know, you can go from a moment where someone is on their knees with their knees getting wet in the sand, thinking about the loss of a friend, to a moment a minute later when kind of a brass band comes past, and everyone's starting to sing songs, then reenactors come past in jeeps. And the tonal shifts are instant and immediate, and, and it can t- take some kind of experience to kind of get used to how quickly the the mood changes because you've got everything happening in the same space at the same time you know like you know omaha beach you can be there with one little group where they're standing holding almost like a candle lit vigil and then somewhere down the beach there's a jeep doing you know right right yeah you know i guess as a young you know being there with these guys you're also documenting how they are reacting as you know slightly more senior gentlemen to the on constant changing things and that 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 must have been surprising for them because I'm some of these veterans hadn't been back before some had been back before but before yeah. but those who hadn't been back since the war they never are prepared no matter how many people tell them this is what it's going to be like and the people going to come up to you want to sight shake your hand take your autograph take your phone when they get here it is overwhelming so how were you as forget about the filmmaker for the for the right. time how did you how do you cope with that process of just transitioning these veterans through this weird process something that you yourself were going through for the first time yeah i mean i there's one moment in the film where don is crying and telling a really difficult story and then we pass by a spitfire and still with tears on his face he goes oh great aircraft great aircraft and you know i feel like that really kind of gets to the heart of what you're saying which is just that it is a really emotionally intense time and you're going from you know, the most kind of giddy excitement to some really, really hard, dark memories in a kind of um, almost like a like a whiplash way, just going back and forth. And I, I know I felt really tired at the end of every day, and I can't imagine what the 90-year-olds felt at the end of every day. But one thing that just amazed me was to see them transform when we got over there. I mean, Don started this process, like at the beginning of the shoot, needed a walker every to go anywhere. Um, He could not walk without a walker. He was very frail. Somehow when we were in Normandy, he shifted to using a cane instead of a walker. And then I would notice that he wouldn't even use the cane. He would just hold onto my arm and use the cane to point at various things that he wanted me to look at. And then he was walking around, not holding my arm, just using his cane as like a pointer. And he just seemed to get revived and get so much, you know, uh, I I mean, it's hard to even describe it. I'm sure you've experienced this, the same thing, but all of that emotion, I mean, I know from, from talking to his family that he was pretty wiped out for a while afterwards, but it just brings a, a level of just kind of joy and meaning and vivaciousness back for them that was extraordinary for me to see. And I've got to say, my entire understanding of old age was completely changed when I was making this film. It really, those veterans taught me that you have to live your life all the way to the end, like, you know, go all out. Um, and yeah, it was incredibly inspiring. And exhausting. <laughs> you know, you're you're making friends with people who were the same age as you when they went through this experience. So again, if that isn't some kind of shortcut to 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 understand their experiences, because I struggle with understanding that veterans were middle aged. I know that veterans are twenty, and I kind of get that they're they're in their nineties now. But it's weird for me that at one point they were my age now. They're in their fifties, still doing tax returns and worried about whether they're going, still going to the pub and that. And that somehow that middle bit of their lives, I feel re- that feels really alien mm. to me. But I can completely get the fact they were young people, and I can see because I've seen it myself, and I'll be seeing it this week what it's like when they come back here again. So it seems to me that your film, Sunken Roads, is more about the whole experience of coming back, that whole, what it means for the veterans, what it meant for you, what the, capturing some of the sights and sounds and smells and experiences there. And um, and 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 relating, and there, there is a photo of your great-great-grandfather, so that kind of started it all off. So 
you know, we'll get to the point of the conversation where, you know, you've been really busy these last few days because it has finally been available on, for DVD set, release and, and, and streaming or what have you. So you've been doing lots of events at the Memorial Day. So tell us about what you've been doing these last few days. Yeah, so um, I've just been really honored to partner with the National Museum of the U.S. Army outside D.C. in uh, Fort Belvoir, Virginia, to present seven special screenings of Sunken Roads over the course of Memorial Day weekend. And um, it's really great to have so many screenings and so many Q and A's because, um, you know, everybody has their family plans for Memorial Day weekend, right? But you know, I think a lot of people were able to figure out a screening time that worked for them, which meant that we had great turnout and the conversations were really meaningful. Um, and to me, it's always like this conversation. It's always so rewarding to talk about Sunken Roads and to share Sunken Roads with people who, you know, really feel these stories and who really, you know, they have a family connection. They have a grandchild they want to introduce to these stories. I mean, it's just been, it's been actually a really emotional and really, really rewarding weekend having those screenings. And then yesterday, after nine years of working on this project, Sunken Roads officially came out on streaming and DVD, which is a right. huge milestone. It's really exciting. Um, so you can find the film on Amazon Prime and you can find it on Vimeo On Demand. And then for DVDs and for more details, if you go to sunkenroads.com, you can uh, get all the links, uh, sign up for our newsletter. We're actually going to have a Blu-ray release pretty soon, nice. um, which is exciting too. So you can find out about that. But one of the things that has been great about preparing the DVD and Blu-ray is that they include bonus scenes, uh, some of which we cut out of the film years ago. I haven't seen myself in years. So preparing these, revisiting some of those scenes, you know, there's a lot more art in. There's a lot more scenes with Joe Balkowski. Uh, with Michael Yanagas, with Suzette. And it really felt like reconnecting with old friends to, <laughs> to see some of those scenes again. So that's been really great too. And the, the interesting thing I think as well is the fact that when you were here for the 70th was a different era than we in, are in now. Because as I said at the beginning, we, the, the door is closing fast on that generation. We really are at the beginning or the middle of this transition period. Yeah, yeah, when for the 70th, we still had the 75th to look forward to, still quite a few guys around then, and ladies around then, and in the years in between. So, you know, you're older, uh, the veterans are older, or they've passed away since then. So maybe there's been a benefit, although you'll be frustrated by the fact it's taken a nine year process, <laughs> but actually the timing for it now might be yeah. more suitable because we're in that transition era there as well. So, and I want to ask you about what you think the future holds for um, connecting this period of history to to the to, for the everyday folk. Because because a lot of my viewers they are hardcore military enthusiasts. They prolific readers. They read all the new books by James Holland and John McManus and Joe Barkovsky. And they like me. World War Two is. A central part of their lives. I have other viewers for whom it's 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 a part of their lives. But the thing is, we're all, without sounding trite, where we are today. The freedoms we 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 enjoy, marrying who we want, traveling where we want to go, all those kind of things are brought about by the what that generation did. So, someone who's considerably younger than me, what what do you think is important to make and uh, ensure that World War Two is still talked about by your generation and now the next generation? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I remember when I went back for the 75th, there was only one veteran from the 29th with the uh, 29th Division Association group. I mean, there had been, I guess, eight of them when I was there and going down to just one was really, um, it felt, I felt keenly at that time how much had been lost. And I, I'm sure now there's, you know, even fewer in general. Um, so that's something that means a lot to me. Um, I feel like sometimes people just say that, you know, millennials and Gen Z people just don't care about history, which is always sad for me to hear. And I think sometimes the um, it's it's not that people don't care. It's that it's not presented in a way that is accessible to them, you know. Um, and so what I'm hoping to do with Sunken Roads is to, you know, eh, I guess, turn a lot of the expectations on their head. I think a lot of um, younger people have a sense of what a war documentary is, especially a World War II documentary, as something that they might not feel uh, 
connects to them or they can't insert themselves very easily into that story. It's hard for them to see themselves in it. So by, you know, by making it such a, uh, you know, in the moment kind of verite style documentary, by, by making the narrator a young woman, by um, making it uh, really about the relationships now, as opposed to the, the history then. Um, I'm hoping that the film is able to kind of, you know, serve as a point of entry for, for younger people. And to that effect, for me, the next step really that I'm excited about is to work to get Sunken Roads integrated into school syllabi and taught in schools and taught in museum educational programs. Because I, uh, I really think that for me, when I was a kid, every time we would watch a movie in school for a history thing, like I remember in fifth grade when we watched the Ken Burns Civil War, I suddenly felt, oh, I feel this now. Like now, now I have the motivation to go and read all those books. Now I have the motivation to dig in deep because I feel it now, you know? And that's um, what I hope we can accomplish by really trying to, you know, in in uh, in the entire course of my K through 12 education, we spent three days on World War II, you know, I and mean, probably three hours on World War II. That includes the Holocaust. And like, when you have that little time to spend, it sometimes gets really dry. You know, you're just looking at a bunch of facts and figures. Numbers and dates. Yeah. 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 So I'm hoping that if, you know, people assign Sunken Roots as a supplementary material where people can go home and watch that, suddenly kids will feel inspired to, on their own time, dig deeper, you know? Um, but it's hard. I mean, I, I, I'm hoping to do that with this film, but, you know, obviously one film isn't the answer to engaging like an entire new generation um, with these stories. And I think the main thing is just uh, almost anybody, I think the easiest way for somebody to develop a passion for a topic is to have a really meaningful conversation with someone they love. So I guess if, you know, if there are young people who you know, who uh, like you assume they might not be interested in this, they, they might be if, if you approach it from kind of like just the human storytelling perspective and, yeah. and give them a chance to really latch on, you know, so. No, definitely. And it seems to me yeah. you know, that that's what you brought to it because even if you carry on talking about this film as you go on for the next 10, 20 years, you'll still always be 20 when you made it. So if right. you are teaching it to high school people, you will you will always be just a few years older than they were when they watch it. You may you will naturally age yourself. But that that point yes. of, of of beginning the journey. And I think with the, with documentary making or book writing, there's a sense that people feel that everything must be some kind of definitive. So everything's mm -hmm. in one package. But I see mm -hmm. no, I think yours is a it's a portal. It's a doorway to something. You're not going to try and explain in a in a documentary the as we said earlier the the combat route of the 29th division and what equipment do they carry and why are they doing this and which, which battalion were they attached to. The, that's that's the that's what they can go on once they've taken that first step down the path. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because that's further down the path. I mean, I know from this channel that he's doing quite well, but we have, according to analytics, I have literally nobody under 18 watches me, not anybody, and like 1% 18 to 23. My uh, my audience is people like me, basically middle-aged male and females who kind of are at that point of life, But which is why I love bringing people like yourself on, because you have the, the ideas that I can't have because I'm a bit older. My stepdaughters give me ideas because they're both, well, mm -hmm. her added youngest tra was trained in editing at, at school. So she she did film editing, but it's different markets, different age groups, different access access points. So um, the links, by the way, are in the description below. So yes, and while we've been talking, at least four or five, you've already bought it and downloaded it and streamed it. So that's great. Yes. Thank you very much. And there'll be lots more people watching it later on. So going back to the film again, I mean, the, the, the process of editing it and getting it all together there, was it, did you find that easy or was there, I mean, you said you ins reinserted some stuff for the Blu-ray that you had literally left, left out. Um, was there lots of stuff you did leave out that you wished you hadn't? Is it, was it, was it complicated? That is such a good question. Um, I feel like there's a lot of stuff that I miss, but I think that the film needed to be the way that it is, you know, um, I think that 
uh, in a 90 minute film, there's only so much room, you know? And with that in mind, Dawn is really our central character. Um, so it meant that a lot of the other scenes that I love so much with other people didn't necessarily make it into the finished film. And I remember feeling really sad about cutting out those scenes at the time, but now being able to bring them back on the DVD and Blu-ray, I'm really happy about it. But the editing process was, you know, second only to the, to the you know, spending every day with Don in the car and Suzette and Arden and Hal. I, the editing process was my favorite part of this. I loved it. And, you know, I had the great uh, ple like pleasure and privilege of hiring my parents to work on this film, um, which, you know, you never know how it goes if you're working with family, <laughs> like if it'll go well or not, but it happened to be just extraordinary. And, you know, my my parents work in, in documentaries, I, inspired me to be a filmmaker. So I knew that if I wanted to, you know, have somebody who really got my vision for this, that that my hiring my dad as the editor would be um, like a great a great way to do that and it was and so the process of kind of finding the film together was incredibly rewarding you know it's really hard when you come away from something like this that's such an emotional kind of overwhelming bewildering personal experience to go okay what out of all of that is the film you know and um there's a lot of overlap, obviously, between my personal memories and the film, but they're not the same. Like it's a there's a sense of direction in the film, right? A sense of plot. Um, so I loved the editing process. It was so great. Uh, the process that I hated was the fundraising process. I, it really is. A, <laughs> it's so overwhelming, and it's like a bad fit for my personality. I just felt so awkward about it, and um, you know, but. I would think about these guys and how old they were getting. Um, and it really made me realize like, okay, I have to get over myself and I have to push through this awkwardness and I just have to do it. And I have to be scrappy and I have to figure out a way to get these funds because I owe it to them. You know, if they trusted me with the, their stories, the least I can do is figure out a way to do it justice, you know? So, um, that was really hard, but I think um, I, I'm really, really glad that I was able to share it with Don, um, share like a, a completed cut of the film with Don before the end. And um, it, uh, yeah, it was crazy. And the reason why it took so long was definitely the fundraising. <laughs> but as you said, I think it, there's something kind of great about it being a little bit of a time capsule. Yeah. No, I mean, and that, again, I want to come back to that point now because, you know, so with, that's why when I found out about this, I thought I want to get Charlotte on now because everybody is now gearing up to Normandy and every year the anniversaries are slightly different and we're all, no, the elephant in the room is how are we going to commemorate this when the veterans are gone? And no one kind of wants to be the first one to say right. that there will be a year when there are no veterans here and and it and it's coming. That year is coming. It won't be this year. It might I don't know. The 80th is two years away. I don't know, but it will it will come. Um, right. And without the personal connections, I mean, Peter Hart, who was on last night, yes, he swore a lot, but Peter Hart worked in Pure War Museum for 40 years collating oral history. So he's interviewed hundreds and hundreds of veterans yeah. and, and was still doing it of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. And, and the voices of those who lived through it will always remain an important route in. Yes, we can debate the tactics and the operations and was this commander good and was that commander, should he have done that and should he have, but the voices of those who are there was important. And also, as what we're talking about, the voices of those when they're revisiting this moment in their lives later, because what they thought about it when they were 20 is clearly going to be different to what they thought about it when they're 90, because yeah. they're looking backwards rather than forwards. And so, again, I want to bring it this this vast age difference between you and these guys you were talking to and and just the way you talk and linguistically the language used by a 20 year old is different to that use so you know you obviously that you know you refer in the documentation of the website that you know that you, you all became like a surrogate granddaughter to them so what what how how did that naturally happen was it just was it just that it it, it happened naturally and it, you just went with it i mean i think it's different for you know the different people i mean for Don, we got along so quickly. I, by the end of our time in England together, he would call me dear heart. <laughs> I, I, like he'd be like, dear heart, 
get over here. <laughs> but, um, and I would call him dude. And like, we had such a close, like jokey relationship with uh, Arden. Like you were saying before, I started off calling him sir all the time. I was very formal. I was very anxious, but I remember, um, I mean, you'll see it in the film. We had a really emotional conversation about uh, just family during the war. And he was talking about how over in Normandy, he was so anxious for his mother at home on the farm and knowing that all four of her sons were overseas and knowing that there's a possibility that none of them would make it back and what would happen to her um, if that were the case. And when he was describing this, I mean, I started crying and he started crying. And from then on, you know, I remember him just holding my hand and realizing, feeling all that formality just melt away. Um, so, you know, I just feel like the age difference is big, but when you're having, like you talked about before, just such an emotionally intense shared experience, it doesn't feel that big. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that was, yeah. And, and when you were talking before about how, you know, we all know that at some point there will be an anniversary with none of them left towards the end of the film. One of the last scenes is, uh, at a, at a world war one memorial and it felt really, um, it loomed large for me looking at that memorial, um, that no one in that generation is. You know, no World War One soldiers were around anymore, and it's not that far between World War One and World War Two, and so just kind of feeling this sense of you know these these Normandy memorials that feel so alive because the veterans are still there. You know what is going to happen um, afterwards, and you know it's something that looms large for me. Um, I'm really. It, it makes me happy to know that you're going to be uh, in Normandy at the commemorations because I mean, I think that um, I think it'll be a really tough uh, time, you know, to bridge between the moment where it's really geared around them being physically present and their personal stories being told by them in the moment and the time when that's not possible anymore. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I hope that Sunken Roads can help to bridge that gap, but I also know that it's just really hard. Um, it's going to be really difficult. I, I mean, I feel like people like yourself and people like Joe Balkowski are really important to that. So, well, thank you. Although we're going to, we're Joe's older than me, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to be doing this forever. And I say that I, what I'm doing is reaching and fulfilling a certain demographic, but it's mm -hmm. not the demographic that's going to take this forward. I mean, it's that. Mm -hmm. Endless debate on Twitter amongst the histor history people is like the, the Dunkirk films. There's mm -hmm. the one with Tom Hardy and and, and yeah. what's a Harry, Harry Styles mm -hmm. it's yeah. the old 1950s one and people of my age tend to like the old 1950s one and the modern the modern one they don't like and I keep saying to people because the reason the, the we're, we're talking about that film that came out Christopher Nolan's film wasn't aimed at the people who liked the film in the 50s it wasn't aimed at the 60 70 year old male right wearing a cardigan, smoking a pipe. It was aimed at young people. My, my, my youngest stepdaughter loved the modern Dunkirk. So that's yeah. why we have to move forward with new storytelling techniques, different ways of doing it. It will be podcasts. It will be whatever comes after podcasts. It will be things right. like this. It will be videos and streaming and things like that and YouTube. And we just have to accept the fact that that is the way to move forward. And it's about br um, bridging across to that. So... Now, filmmaking is one particular thing, and Sunken Roads, we hope, will we'll do its part. Then if you can get that into schools, that's fantastic. Um, what other kind of aims do you have? I mean, do you see yourself returning to World War II? Are you, are you, I mean, are you a filmmaker professionally now still? Or? Yes. Yeah, so my next film is not about World War II, it's, but it is related to this. So I'm in midway through production on a new feature-length film, which is about COVID memorials. Um, okay. And with that film, you know, it's also, it is a very personal story. One of the main characters is the mother of one of my closest childhood friends. But yeah, it's, um, it's about two memorials and one of them is just a memorial to one person, just grieving the loss of one relationship that was a pillar in this person's life for 50 years. And then the other memorial is kind of modeled after the AIDS quilt, and it's being created by thousands of families across the city of Detroit. So 
with this next film, I'm really trying to get at this question of, you know, after kind of um, an event where a lot of, there's a lot of loss and a lot of grief and World War II was like that. And COVID has been like that, obviously incredibly different events, but do you, there's a similarity in the theme. Yeah. Um, just what do we do after that? Like, what do you do just as one person who misses your loved one? What do you do as a city or as a community? And, you know, just, I guess, uh, how do we move forward? And so, yeah, it's it's a film that in many ways is really different. But to me, I, I feel the connections between these two projects very strongly. Oh, no, definitely. I mean, and without going down a big talk about COVID, the thing is COVID for all it, for it's horrible, but it did link the world again. We, we, it, it, it was, it was, yeah. um, this was if this respective of class and nationality and color and gender and stuff, you could be affected by it, which is exactly the same as World War Two. is that it hit True. every single corner of that globe. And we were we were united in how we had to deal with World War Two, And to the most extent, we were united with how we dealt with COVID, albeit different policies from different countries. But sure. we all had to face it. And just going through lockdown and all that it was, was a, you know, it's why people like me are doing what I'm doing, because I was, couldn't do my normal job because I was a battlefield right. guide. So I've been to, doing do this mm -hmm. now transitioning back into going out and talking to people actually at Battlefield because right, right. it's Omaha Beach and that's fantastic. So um, you know, we, we've talked about the hopes of it. We've talked about where we can get it there. So, you know, I, I, I like to think there are more people like you out there, Charlotte, who are going to connect with this World War II and find a means of explaining it to the next generation that is, is a means I won't be able to come up with because I'm already too far removed from it because I'm a book buyer and that's what I am. I can't, I am a middle-aged white balding bald um, guy and I can't change that. So I'm really delighted to bring people like you on who are, who've got this other way of looking at it. So anything else you want to see about, say about sunken roads to this, to the audience of primarily World War II buffs watching this, what are they going to get out of watching it? Um, I'll say, you know, if there is somebody in your life, a, a grandchild, a niece, a nephew, just a younger friend who you really want to share this with and they haven't been really uh, so as enthusiastic as you'd hope, I, I hope that Sunken Roads can be a way to kind of introduce that to them. I also just want to say if you do watch the film, stream it, buy a DVD, etc., it would mean a lot to me if you would take a couple minutes to just rate and review the film on Amazon and on Rotten Tomatoes. So at this kind of early stage, since we just released it yesterday, having a bunch of, you know, a bunch of five star reviews early on can actually make a really big difference. So, um, yeah, I would really appreciate that. And then sunkenroads.com is where you can sign up for our newsletter. I'll also give the option once I start a newsletter for my next film for anybody who's already subscribed to Sunken Roads to sign on for information about the next film. And then uh, sunkenroads.com is also where, you know, you can find out more about our characters, more about our filmmaking team and um, yeah, and get those direct links. I mean, I, I know that you've linked, linked it below, yeah. but um yeah, that's that's our website, and that's where all the news is. So, <laughs> thank well, you. Well, brilliant. So much. I mean, there are educators watching this, and there are people who, you know, university professors. And so we have quite a global reach, albeit within a kind of a niche World War Two buff. Where, but Twitter can do its thing, Facebook can do its thing, and all I'm supposed to do is kind of be the conduit, like you are the conduit between yourself and the veterans. I'm the conduit between sunken roads and getting it to a a, a different audience to the audience you're getting into already, because it seems to me that. It needs more than just being circulated amongst that kind of World War II buff. Yeah. That what, what will work is if it reaches, as you said there, beyond that. And I'm, I'm hoping there are lots of fathers and mothers who are trying to get their kids and grandkids into this. This may be the thing. I've tried them on war films. I've tried them on that book. They're leaving <laughs> table books open and hoping kids will look yeah. at it. Maybe Sunken Roads is just that one thing that will convert them. So I hope so. I'm absolutely delighted like to, to oh. speak to you. Thank you. I also just want to say that Sunken Roads is available on Canopy as well for folks who are educators, which is a platform that's free for most people with a university email address, free for most people with a library card. Um, so I really, as I mentioned before, I'm really passionate about having Sunken Roads shared in an educational space, and I'm always down to do Zoom Q&As afterwards. So if you want to reach out on the contact page on sunkenroads.com, um, I'm would be delighted to kind of hear from any of you if you have any other questions or just want to chat, but also 
if you uh, if you do want to bring Sunken Roads to your community or to share it with an educational group, I can talk talk with you more about that there. Brilliant. Well, I, I, I've already had requests to bring you back again, so maybe oh. we can do some post Normandy. We can do something else. Maybe we can get you know, a panel discussion. I want to do a panel discussion at some point about how how we can help with bringing different media into education so we can perhaps bring someone from academia on someone from movie making or whatever we can do that as well but it's great Jordan. i'm just going to take you off screen while i remind people we're coming up and i'll come back and say goodbye in a second so folks we have a second show coming at you later on so 7 p.m gmt 2 p.m eastern we have marcus brotherton as a long-term friend of mine he wrote books about some of the easy company guys his latest book is about this amazing story of a 15 year old american kid who found himself in the military at the time of Bataan, survived prison of war camp and marcus writes these wonderful books that have this message of redemption and forgiveness and a journey so it's not just a harrowing account of a, of a, of a pow experience it's about what the pow went through and how marcus was able to kind of share that story so marcus is definitely a guest not to miss as usual all the links you need the links to charlotte's website sunken Rose, all in the description below the links to our social media all in the description below and you guys watching who are brilliant share this on twitter twitter share it on social media so don't share me i mean share charlotte's film that's what i'm asking you to do i i, I get enough of your help so do that i'm gonna bring charlotte back in just to say uh good day and any more screenings coming up or are you kind of off now for a couple of days um, so I'm taking a little bit of a break, but we will definitely have a lot more in-person screenings in the future. I feel like it's such a, uh, it, it's a film that really benefits from watching it together in a space right. and kind of, yeah, so that matters a lot to me. So if you join our newsletter, I'll be sure to keep you updated about future events. Brilliant. Well, there we are then. This is Paul with us from World War II TV. I will see you all again in two hours for another show. And Charlotte, thank you very much for joining us and good thank luck. You. with Road. And let's hope it becomes a staple of education throughout the world for the next three generations. That'd be fantastic. Cheers then, everybody. Thanks for watching. See you later. Bye. Bye.